there, and welcome to our conclusion segment for the Home Grid series. In part one, we looked at the artist himself and the cover image that I'm copying. In part two, we looked at domestic science and home economics using Christina Frederick and Betty Crocker as touch points for a little additional context. And in part three, we looked at the colonial revival and a little bit about design history, craft history, water deck arts. And in part four, this section right here, we're gonna try to bring this image up to contemporary times with a little segue into the Great Depression, the Works Progress Administration, and all the art that they made. Well, some of the art that they made. Let's get to it. Our Holmgren image is extra interesting as it's from 1938, which was in the thick of the American Great Depression. The Depression ran from 1929 to 1941. The 30s were actually a time of great American artistic output, as the Works Progress Administration, or WPA, put in place under Franklin Delano Roosevelt, created many jobs for artists. Some of these jobs were aimed at beautifying government buildings through murals, many were geared toward documenting American life, and another initiative put in place by the WPA was the Index of American Design. Artists working on this project were charged with documenting American material culture in order to showcase national identity and create a handbook for future artists to use as inspirational references. America was coming into its own as an international power and didn't need to look at classical or European forms anymore. The index was produced from 1936 to 1942 and includes about 18,000 watercolor renderings of American decorative art and material culture objects from the colonial period through the 19th century. This includes portrayals of clothing, toys, furniture, pottery, textiles, and much more. You can actually look through the index on the National Gallery of Arts website. This project fostered not only an interest in American identity, but also a developing sense of regionalism in the United States. For example, the colonial revival pieces that seemed at home in New England were different than the indigenous pottery present in the Southwest. The interest in antiques and material culture goes along with a growing interest in American folk art, or artworks created by everyday Americans who were not formally trained. For more information on this subject, I'd suggest A Kind of Archaeology, Collecting American Folk Art by Elizabeth Stillinger, or The Great American Thing, Modern Art and National Identity, 1915-1935 by Wanda Korn. The notion of American folk music generated through people like A.P. Carter and the Carter Family Singers also provide the nascent materials of the country music genre around this time and it remains a creative form of expression that often focuses on a strong sense of nostalgia. The idea of finding a communal national or regional identity was strengthened in the early 20th century. Those regional identities especially largely whitewashed the atrocities that targeted black and indigenous peoples up to that point and reiterated an implicit and explicit power dynamic in favor of white people. This shows up in lots of mediums, in movies like D.W. Griffith's America and in books like Margaret Mitchell's Gone with the Wind. This time period also has complicated tensions about America's founding and often outright abuse of indigenous peoples. To learn more about the complexity of those relationships and how they relate to art, I would suggest reading Native American Art in the 20th Century, Makers, Meanings, Histories by W. Jackson Rushing. The interest in American identity and comfort in looking to the past was a definite trend in the early 20th century, and it's still one that's around today. Many people still like to make things by hand, make crafts, purchase handmade items, and connect with the past, like Civil War reenactors, or purchase products that evoke the spirit of the past, like Reed Drummond's approach to cooking. I've been to the Mercantile and her baked goods are absolutely worth the journey, but I'm not entirely convinced that a state-of-the-art kitchen complete with floral printed appliances quite speaks to the difficulties of settling a homestead on the western frontier. One thing that does remain timeless is a desire for things to be simpler, safe, and connected to humanity. Looking back at the past for some could be like watching a rerun of your favorite TV series, Seinfeld, Little House on the Prairie, you know what the twists and turns are, and you know how those familiar narratives end. 
The present can be very uncertain, and the future isn't known, but the past remains, for some people, and in some respects, steadier. Though comfort is only one of many, many lenses through which the past may be viewed, and comfort is probably not something black, indigenous, or people of color are struck with when looking to the past, especially in a visual culture vernacular that did not fairly acknowledge them or their contributions and accomplishments. So this has been our look into John Holmgren and the Colonial Revival. I hope you've enjoyed it. And please tune in next time to learn more about George Petty, the Petty Girl, classic Hollywood, and pinup culture. Till next time!